for a moment about how you were first taught to pray. What did it look like? What did it feel like? Who was in the mix? Maybe where did it actually begin? Some of us learned bedtime prayers, right? With parents maybe sitting around the couch or uh, kneeling at the bedside when we were really little, saying that prayer that many of us probably know, now I lay me down to sleep and pray the Lord my soul to keep, right? Um, and these prayers, these words, they come to us when we are younger and we continue to mature, but the center of those prayers often remains the same. Did you notice? Me, I, kind of focus on ourselves, which certainly has its place. I think even about, as I've uh, come to be a little older and had kids of my own, um, as we've been trying to teach them uh, to pray, we got one of these prayer dice. It's nothing fancy or you know special from any place. You can get it on Amazon, lots of different spots. But it's a wonderful resource just to um, help young people have words when they can't maybe string them together yet, right? And so, you know, our family, we fight about who gets to actually throw the dice, and then it goes across the table and then lands on one. And for instance, they sound like this. Father, my praise I gladly give in all I do and think and live. Amen. For joy and plenty, health and power, I thank you, Father, every day for this hour. Amen. So, and there are lots of them. But I do think it is um, important for us to pay attention to the words that we say and I guess the central focus when we do offer those prayers uh, to the God who loves us. Words can be a powerful communication tool to God. Communication about our needs, our desires, our hopes, our thanksgivings to God. But often it feels like a one-sided conversation, or perhaps we only allow it to be, cutting off the space for conversation when our words end. But I wonder what was the very last time that uh, you looked outside at the stars when there was a cloudless night. Or maybe you allowed yourself to actually stop at the stoplight for a minute and see the beautiful surroundings that uh, are everywhere around you in this uh, small car, right? Small person, small car, big life. And as we think about the way that we uh, inhabit the world as one small part of a much greater whole, it reminds me of those times when uh, in the history books we saw folks actually come to realize this, not just for themselves, but for all of us in the way of science and mathematics and the uh, the different times in the Renaissance where discoveries were made and our whole worldview is completely changed. Like, uh, and I may have mentioned this in a class at one time or another, but I think it's an important metaphor, Copernicus, right? Uh, he was an astronomer who literally shook the foundation of the world whenever he came up with the model of the universe that we know today that places the sun in the center of our galaxy rather than earth and our very selves at the center of everything else that orbits around us. Wondrously and mysteriously, God moves from the very periphery of our experience into the center when we allow, allow ourselves to think about what that might mean what does this have to do with prayer at all, this sense about placement? Richard Foster said it in a way that I thought was really helpful. Uh, he was a great leader in spiritual formation, and he offered, in the be beginning, we are indeed the very subject and center of our prayers. But slowly, almost imperceptibly, there is a shift and a center of gravity. We pass from thinking of God as a part of our life to the realization that we are a part instead of God's life. 
So James Howell said it another way. He says this is really our participation uh, in however small or large or long a prayer that we offer. It's a participation in a revolution of our spiritual lives that we have to learn and see and discover again and again. Not thinking about only our own needs, desires, fears, problems, mistakes, but to be caught up in the way of Jesus swept up in the life of the spirit in a relationship of love with our maker that actually does remake us we talked about that some last week the effect that it has on you and me the human being when we pray but today uh, we want to look at the ways that it begins to reorient us so that we can be a life made for others Sherry mentioned that this scripture that Emma read for us is often a text that we hear during Lent, particularly on Holy Week. I don't know about you, but until I preached it at another time, the only time I ever heard this story about Jesus praying at the Garden of Gethsemane was at Maundy Thursday service, or maybe even you know on Good Friday service if they had a compilation of different stories about Jesus' sacrifice. But this small, very poignant, moment where Jesus pulls away as a stone's throw from the crowd and then prays in the midst of a grove of olive trees that even today if you go to the Holy Land they're still there. And he uh, kneels and prays to his Lord saying, Father remove this cup from me please. Do you hear the relief or the desire for it? Not what I want but what do you want? What do you want of me, of my life, of my time? Even when fe things feel so desperate and uncertain and at their end. Jesus was opening up a channel and paying attention, even when there were a million reasons in, in his life to do otherwise. And in the same way, I think that is the thing that we are called to, to consider the ways that prayer might open us up to a whole new reality of the world and the pain and joy within it. That in the hustle and bustle of our everyday lives, we often choose to miss. The best way that I've ever heard uh, prayer described, particularly about what we believe is happening uh, when prayer works, <laughs> is not just about outcomes of our words, but it is the outcome that happens in a material and more of a cosmic sense. And these, uh, this thought is from Henry Nouwen in his work called Love in a Fearful Land. He says, prayer is the way to both the heart of God and the heart of the world in which we live, precisely because they have been joined through the suffering of Jesus. Praying is letting one's own heart become the place where the tears of God's children merge and become tears of hope. Again, prayer is the way to both the heart of God and the heart of the world, where we find ourselves as the bridge, as the hinge, as the place where those two things meet. So when we look at the story uh, another way, we can see that as Jesus comes up from this gut-wrenching moment of prayer where he's asking for help and relief and guidance, he goes back to his friends and they're in some uh, form of sleeping or rising, uh, having been waiting for him. And she encounters them and says, all of a sudden, what business do you have sleeping? Wake up! Wake up to everything happening in this beautiful, awkward, wild world around us. God has given us, I almost imagine Jesus saying this, God has given us the eyes to see as we are made in God's image, the ears to hear as we have God's heart in our heart, 
that can actually feel the way that God feels pouring out for the world. Take it all in. Don't miss it. And don't allow even the awareness of it to pass you and me by without concern. Some people in uh, historical Christianity did this well. It wasn't the clerics like me. It wasn't uh, necessarily everyday people, even though there are many witnesses, testimonies, and stories to that reality being true. But it is the people that we called, even in the first centuries, desert mothers and fathers. They were people that basically gave their lives to the way of prayer, which seems like just a luxury to many of us today, you know, going off on your own little desert vacation and uh, finding uh, time to just be able to think and pray for what you like. But it was a gut-wrenching work because it wasn't these men and women going out into wilderness and certain uh, solitary places for themselves. No, when they were alone, the only thing they were doing, their only focus, their only purpose and attention was praying for all of us. Everyone in the cities and the towns, everyone who is gathered in places just like this, trying to find our way. These are the ones who uh, believed that we are less human when we take for granted full bellies and healthy bodies. Ultimately, they were schooled in the love of God and the love of neighbor as they urged us and urge us now, because they still exist, to look beyond ourselves, to practice an embodied way of faith and always question whether our well-being is coming at the expense of another's scarcity. I want you to think about your life today. I want you to think about the times where you have prayed. Do you see a pattern? Not just maybe everyday rhythms, but the times where you perhaps felt compelled to pray, whether it be out loud or often, more often it is uh, to yourself, um, but maybe even in the company of someone else. What have those patterns been? What are the things that have perhaps pricked your heart? Maybe times of trouble for yourself or someone else? When a friend is sick or grieving the loss of a loved one? Maybe it's not always prayer in painful moments. It might be prayer that continues to happen for the dreams that are deferred and unrealized in your life or in the life of someone you care about. Maybe it is a prayer for uh, the people above you who took care of you and now ail themselves or the ones under you that are uh, in such a small and vulnerable way trying to figure out what it means to live as God's child and as a human being. Whatever comes to your mind, whatever pattern you might notice, um, even if it's a concern uh, about political or uh, or spiritual things, whatever it may be, this passion perhaps reveals your connection and call to the world's greatest need, and that is your vocation with God. I was talking to the Carpenters Sunday School class about that just last week, this idea that Nowen brought up about, again, the merging, the, the meeting the melding of these two things that we and the world are never separate but always integrated entangled whether we want to be or not this is a lifetime of learning how to be in the midst of this mixing and melding and to live in a way that counts and has consequence Anthony DeMello said, there are miracles and then they are miracles. Some say a miracle occurs when God does someone's will as we pray, but others say a miracle happens when someone does God's will in the first place. 
A prayer can be a tangible practice to help us rediscover God's wisdom, God's will, God's uh, desire through our lives, through words, and then oftentimes without words. So as we consider what this means for us, I invite you to go this week into two places. One uh, really without and one within. I want you to generate in yourself, even if it's just one moment, that knack for noticing how truly small we are in the midst of this larger world where we uh, continue to orbit around the way of God. And second, I want you to reflect even more on maybe that need that came up in your mind. Or if one didn't come up, uh, open up more space where that awareness might even emerge for you. It could be uh, ones who hunger. It could be a concern about the environment or, or folks in need of care in different facilities. There are any number of possibilities. But once you have seen that need and become painfully or maybe joyfully aware of it, Find a way to connect to it in a way that counts. We never know how God will answer our prayers, but we can expect that God will get us involved in God's plan for an answer, can't we? Prayer works, but it does recenter and reorient us. Our prayer puts God at the very center of our lives, and prayer is the way to both the heart of God and the heart of the world. How will you walk in that way today? In the name of God who was and is and is to come, amen.